wanted to pivot for this week because of the time that we find ourselves in. And I want to share a message with you today called Walking Through the Shadows. So let's just pray. Father God, I thank you for how you're with us in every season. You're not just with us on the mountaintops, but you're with us in the valleys. And I want to thank you, God, that you're not just with us in our pleasures, but you're with us in our pain. And so, God, I pray that you would just put your arms around us like only you can do. God, I pray that even though we're limited to this digital platform, I wish, uh, Lord Grace and I, we wish we could just put our arms around everybody in the church today and hug and support one another. And in this time of distancing and isolation and lockdowns and all these things, God, we need you and we need one another. But I pray that you would just fill in the gaps by your grace and by your presence, that you would just do a work to touch our hearts right now, that you would help us through grief and sorrow and you would cause our faith to be strengthened through the difficult seasons that we're in. We pray that you would surround Leanne and the family, Lord God, the Smith family. We pray that you would help them through this time of loss. And Lord, as many of us are grieving, we're also trying to comfort each other. And we find ourselves in these difficult uh, moments, Lord God, not knowing how to always process our emotions. But I thank you that we get to do this together, God, with you and with one another. Lord, there's no other church family I'd rather be stuck in a struggle or in a, in a tough season in than with, the, with these uh, saints of the Lord at sunrise. And so I thank you, God, for what you would do. And I thank you that you would just manifest yourself as good shepherd, that you would break our illusions and the ways that we don't see you as we should and that you would strengthen us, that you would deliver us from fear, Lord. And we thank you that you invite us to your table to fellowship with you and come into a place of rest, God, where you restore us in Jesus' mighty name, amen. So walking through the shadows and 2020 has been a year of walking through the shadows. And I know there's been a lot of controversy about the prophetic words that have come out, and I think we need the prophetic, and I thank God for prophets. We need more, not less prophecy, but we need to do prophecy well, and we need to judge and weigh and discern prophetic words very carefully. And we had a prophetic words that, you know, 2020 was going to be the, a new roaring 20s, and it was going to be the year of clear vision, and, and it has not really felt like a year of clarity. <laughs> it hasn't felt like a year of great prosperity, and people are in a lot of there's a lot of struggle. There's a lot of difficulties. There's a lot of shadows. There's a lot of darkness that people are walking through in 2020. And I know it could be that maybe by the end of 2020, everything becomes clear. And maybe those, some of those words make sense more uh, once we get through the year. I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not trying to cast shade on any prophetic ministers or on the prophetic ministry itself. But we need to be discerning because a lot of us, we weren't really prepared to walk through the difficult things of 2020. We kind of had our eyes on growth, expansion, prosperity, you know, um, all these different things coming and it just hasn't felt that way. And of course, with our elections, there's been people that are just uh, relieved and excited that uh, Joe Biden has been, uh, has been declared the president-elect and there's people that are con convinced that it is an absolute conspiracy and it's a corrupt election and that Trump will still win and be the president once it goes through the courts. And I'm confident I have peace in God that whoever wins, that Jesus is on the throne and that as a church, we should support whoever is the president and we should also oppose them prophetically in a sense uh, where we have to oppose them as people of faith. But I believe that I have confidence that there are more eyes, there are more lawyers, that there is more being unveiled about our voting systems and elections that I believe we're going to get a fair outcome. And so we need to pray. We need to be a people of peace. We need to be a distinctive people that make a difference in this time, irregardless. But what I'm trying to say is there's, it's these times of shadows. It's these times of darkness. It's this, these times of, of great tension. And we've, you know, we've, we've been through so much uh, as pastors, as churches, as believers, where we feel a lot of the pressure. We feel a lot of the, the things that are going on and, and it has not been an easy season to navigate. And then this last week or two has just been very challenging. And Pastor Scott, of course, dying and leaving us, getting a call. Grace and I were on a, we were on our anniversary staycation and we were our first day away. We were at Leavenworth and we were enjoying time together and we drove home that night and had dinner and got home and about eight o'clock at night, uh, as our kids were being watched by, my, by their grandparents, we, uh, we were just enjoying our time and we get a call at eight o'clock at night from my dad saying that he and my brother-in-law, Jason, are on their way 
um, up to the Smith house because there was medics trying to revive Pastor Scott. And I'm, we're thinking, what on earth does it mean that you have to revive Pastor Scott? Does that mean he's incapacitated? Does it mean he's dead? Like, this is, you know, it's just shocking. And my dad said, well, you're on, you're on vacation time. We're, we're going to be there. We're, it's okay. We'll, we just want you to know what's happening. And so we uh, said, no, we're going. And so we got in our car and we drove, we left right away. And we beat um, everybody up there. Uh, Leanne was out of town at her mom's in Missouri. And Chris and Nick and Whitney were all in the home. And we got there, there were some police officers there, but the medics had already left after they had spent 15, 20 minutes or so trying to revive Scott. And we walked in and there's our pastor, our friend, our mentor laying on the floor in the living room with a blanket over his face and over his body. And so we got there and Grace and I, we started to pray that God would raise him, that God would thump his heart and bring his spirit back and cause him to rise. And then many pastors and staff, uh, many friends of their family from the church and young adults that have been blessed by their ministry so much over the years just showed up and started praying that God would raise Pastor Scott. And I was so proud of the people standing in faith for a miracle. And we were there to comfort the family, of course, because it's shocking. It's shocking for all of us. We were, we were, but we're also praying and contending for a miracle. And so... Uh, we people prayed for about probably almost two hours before the funeral home eventually came and, and took his body away. And we, uh, we're, we're all kind of just, everything just feels like it, you know, it just unraveled so quick. Uh, and somebody that you just always think is going to be there as a pillar in your life is just, is just removed uh, so quickly. And so I know that many of us are still, you know, in disbelief, are moving from, you know, anger to sadness and back and forth and we're in disbelief sometimes you're kind of bargaining like well if I would have done this or if I would have known this or what if this would have happened and that's all a normal healthy part of a grief process and I know for me I'm moving between laughter and tears uh, a lot of the time and that's been one of the ways that's helped me um, grieve is to get my tears out and I've had a couple days I had really a lot of puffiness under my eyes and uh it, you know, I um, just I cried as many tears as I could cry. And then we've laughed so hard at different memories that we've had with Scott um, that have been precious memories that we're thankful for. And so processing all of that and then figuring out what's going on in the church and then looking at another conference potentially being canceled by government mandates. And, you know, uh, Pastor Andre's dad, uh, Ronald, um, just passed away, went to be with the Lord just the week before Pastor Scott died. And uh, then my dad was going to do the memorial service with their family this week. And then he got these cold flu symptoms, he and my mom. And so he felt like he really shouldn't do it. So thankfully, Pastor Kevin was able to step in and be there with the Benjamin family uh, in their time of remembering their dad's life. Uh, but it was like another thing. Now my dad can't go to that, you know, and and then uh, Friday, my parents and Saturday, they get tested for, uh, they got tested for COVID earlier in the week, and they both got their results Friday and Saturday that they're positive for COVID-19. Now, thankfully, their tests, where they are positive, their symptoms are not extreme. They're breathing okay. They're recovering. Uh, they don't have fevers. They are, um, you know, they, they really are navigating it well, so keep praying for them. But it was like, Oh, you know, another thing, they can't be here. And then they were around all of our staff this week. We had a time on Wednesday to pray together and uh, grieve and share memories. And it was just, it was a beautiful, it was a hard time. It was a beautiful time to be together. But they were around all of our staff. And so in good faith, we had to, felt that we really needed to shut down service uh, this weekend uh, to find out if anybody caught anything and to make sure that the, the church is, Family is, is kept safe in this time, and we're not afraid of the disease, but we do realize we have lost some people that we know and love and respect in the body of Christ throughout this season, and your safety is important to us. And so we really uh, thought, oh, unfortunately, we don't want to shut down, but we have to. And then I'm at home this week, and I'm 
hearing our governor come on and talk about Washingtonians not celebrating Thanksgiving and my blood, I could just feel my stress level. Like literally, like if there was like a little meter graph, I could just see it like rising and it's getting red. And or like, I'm like, please don't take my blood pressure right now. I'm like, I just couldn't take anything else. Like, please, 2020 has enough and I just don't want to hear about anything else right now. And then my kids are reminding me that when my dad tested positive or got his results back for a positive COVID test that, um, that it was Friday the 13th. And I thought, I'm not superstitious at all. Uh, and I don't really believe in that stuff. But I'm like, it just sounded about right. Of course it's Friday the 13th. Like, like what other day would it be when you find out that just something else goes wrong Um, it feels like. But we've really been walking through the shadows. We've really been walking through darkness and through these difficult times. But I believe that the Lord wants to manifest himself as a good shepherd. He wants to manifest himself as a host that spreads a table for us to minister to us in the presence of our enemies during this time. And so I want to share this psalm with you. It's a psalm that uh, is maybe one of the most popular passages in all of the Bible for even people that aren't Christians often will know. Psalm 23, because it's quoted at so many funerals and memorials. It's, it's been a given strength to people in times of grief or times of suffering ever since it's been written. And so uh, I would like to read it to you today from the NIV, Psalm 23, a Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Well, I want to give you a few snapshots that I want to kind of look at in understanding how the Lord wants to minister to us as a church family through this time of grief, through this time of loss, through this time of walking through the shadows in our lives and in this season. And the first thing David says is that the Lord is my shepherd. And this is really uh, everything in this psalm hinges on have you made the Lord your shepherd? Has he become your source, your guide, your leader, your comforter, your strength, the one that that protects and guards you and guides you? Because really everything is contingent on who he is and how you see him. See, he says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Why do you lack nothing? It's because he is your shepherd. Now, it's very easy in the natural to look around and feel like, well, God, I lack all sorts of things. I lack Pastor Scott now. Uh, We lack... Um, the freedom to uh, do different things that we used to get to do. All these different places are getting shut down again. Uh, Maybe I lack money or I lack a job or I lack the ability to meet with friends right now and congregate with people in a way that is meaningful and, and ministers to my heart. So I'm lacking a lot of things. But what happens in times like this where all these things get stripped away from us, we find out that if the Lord is truly our shepherd, then he is enough. And what we learn is it's not that we, it's not that we necessarily have all the material things that we've always ever wanted in our lives because the Lord is our shepherd, but when we learn that he is our shepherd and we go through these dark seasons, when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, when we walk through the shadows in life, these, can, these trials and tests can reveal to us that all we really do need is the Lord. And even though we might not have anything else, when we have him, we have everything. When we have him, we lack nothing. And so it's, it's, it's difficult. It's not to minimize the losses that we go through. We've gone through many, many griefs in 2020. We've gone through many, many sorrows, been through many, many battles in 2020. But in the middle of these griefs, in the middle of these shadows, when we know that the Lord is with us, then we know that we lack nothing because everything we truly need is in him. My daughters, my two oldest kids, my oldest girls, they were growing. I remember when they were younger, and the, the, my baby at the time had just gotten potty trained. And so we were in a car ride, and we were really trying to convince her, you know, you're, you can do it. You can hold it. Like, you're not going to have an accident in the car. You're going to make it. You're going to make it home. We're going to make it to the potty. And uh, so, you know, we're all trying to encourage her, like, we're almost home. You can do it. We believe in you. And uh, her older sister uh, says to her, she's like, 
Think of unicorns and ponies, or maybe it's rainbows and ponies and everything you've ever wanted. You know, and she was trying to get her mind on, like, think of all the happy things you've ever wanted in life. And we just cracked us up. It's like, everything you've ever wanted. And she's just trying to support her sister. Like, she's going to make it, you know? And I think she did make it, actually. I think she made it all the way home. Um, but uh, it just cracked us up. And I think sometimes as Christians, we think that, if the Lord is our shepherd and we're not going to lack anything, that we're going to have everything we've ever wanted. And we're going to have all our material needs and life is going to be easy. And I'm here to tell you that's just simply not the case. That when the Lord is our shepherd, we lack nothing because of who he is in our lives. He will be good to provide what we need. He will provide in every season. But sometimes he provides everything we need while we're in a jail cell for Christ, like the Apostle Paul. Like sometimes um, we, he provides everything we need uh, while we're being persecuted for our, our faith or while we're like, Elijah, who's, you know, uh, on the run for his life, he, he provides food. Or sometimes we're like the children of Israel and we're wandering in the desert and he provides manna and he provides those basic needs, but they, did, they weren't necessarily in the promised land as fast as they wanted. And it, part of that had to do with their own disobedience, of course. But what I'm trying to say is not everything in life and not every promise in the Bible is like a magic wand that makes your life like you know, it's like we, I, we do pray for heaven on earth, but we, sometimes we think that we're going to get the fullness of God's kingdom manifest here and now a hundred percent. And, and like, uh, if we just had enough faith, we'd have no troubles in life. But I will submit to you, the Bible does not promise you a shadow free, trouble free, obstacle free, challenge free life. The Bible says you're going to have tribulations. The apostle Paul taught through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. So this whole idea of a kingdom lifestyle does not mean a, a tiptoe through the tulips with Jesus. Where every day is easy, you have all this money, you get to do whatever you want all the time, nothing sad ever happens. No, we, we live in a fallen world. We live in a world that's in conflict between the kingdom of heaven being established on the earth and the kingdom of darkness is losing his, Satan is losing his grip on the planet but we don't see the fullness of God's kingdom ushered in until the last enemy death is destroyed and put under the feet of Jesus at his return, where he ushers in his eternal kingdom forever and ever. So it's very important that we understand who the Lord is because circumstances will try to cause you to not be able to trust that the Lord is truly a good shepherd. And I think that, you know, many of us have asked this question is like, why Pastor Scott? Why right now? You know, I was like, Man, we already had to replace four pastors or staff members. And now we lost another one. And I don't, I'm just like, another thing? Please, not another thing. And we got to be careful because it's okay to question. It's okay to process those things. But we've got to be careful not to... Um, not to get, allow ourselves to get overwhelmed with things that may not be, actually be true, right? To give ourselves to false fears. And so, uh, it, but it's, it's, it's normal to have these questions, but we have to be careful that we have a conviction of who God is based on his word and based on his track record with us, not based on our circumstances or our emotions or what a doctor says or what the news media says or what other people try to put on us, but we become a people that walk in alignment with the word of God. And we declare that he is my shepherd and therefore I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters, David said. He refreshes my soul. Some translations say he restores my soul. And this is so important uh, for us as believers, as believers that believe the word of God, as believers that believe that we can heal the sick and cleanse the leper and raise the dead. We need to be a distinctive people of faith, but we also need to be a people that have a restored soul. And a lot of Christians have learned how to be strong spiritually, or have been taught at least, how to be strong spiritually. But sometimes we use our spirituality as a cloak for not really dealing with the issues of our soul. And what the Lord wants to do as our good shepherd is he wants to bring healing. He wants to bring refreshing. He wants to bring restoration to our soul, the realm of our mind and our will and our emotions. Now, we've been taught very often in the church that we got to look good, act good, act like we believe, act like we're walking in faith, say the right things, um, 
You know, be spiritually strong. Confess the word. Disregard your feelings. But that's actually bad advice to disregard our feelings. We should not live by our feelings. If you live by your feelings, you will be a prisoner of your emotions. You will be up and down. You'll be all over the place. You cannot live by your emotions. But you also can't ignore them or stuff them or disregard them. Because they will get the best of you. And so... We've got to learn how to not just be spiritually strong, but how to be emotionally strong. And part of the way that we're emotionally strong is not by just toughing things out, but is by allowing God into our emotions, into our soul to uh, allow him to minister to us. And if you look at the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount that we're going through in our current series, and you look through a lot of the Psalms, like there is, these are, these are invitations to become emotionally healthy people. And what happens when we stuff our emotions is we don't deal with them. And so we try to control how we feel by acting spiritually strong. But sometimes that can come out through anger in our parenting, in our marriage, and come out through trying to control others. Or or, uh, there's a lot of ways we end up coping with uh, that are unhealthy with our emotions if we don't learn how to process them in a godly way and allow God into those places of how we really feel. There's a man that I've enjoyed looking up his ministry and kind of his, his business that he does kind of combined together. He, or he's, he has this outreach called the Cave of Adullam. His name is Jason Williams, and there's some really powerful YouTube videos with him. He runs this Cave of Adullam as a place for young men, uh, basically young black men in the Detroit area that are coming in many out of at-risk situations. And he trains them from about maybe 8 or 10 years old till middle school or high school. And he trains them in martial arts and self-defense. And he, he trains and disciples them how to be a good student and how to be a follower of Christ and why they should believe in God and why they should, uh, you know, live a life of purpose and meaning. And, and one of the things, he actually wrote a book called Cry Like a Man because he thinks one of the most important things for young men and really for anybody is to learn how to process their emotions. And he has a little acronym for the word thug and he says a thug because he worked with a lot of gang member kids that could be at risk for gangs or reached out to the 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 community of gangs where he's at and he says a thug is a is a traumatized human that's unable to grieve a traumatized human that's unable to grieve and when we don't know how to grieve or we don't know how to walk through the difficult times where God uh, wants to refresh us and minister to us we start um we, 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 we get angry, we get vengeful, and, and those things are going to come out somewhere in our lives if we don't deal with them properly. And Jason Williams, he had a lot of life experience. He decided, I mean, he's a man's man. He, this guy is strong. He trained, he's been a lifetime martial artist. He's trained several martial arts. Uh, the, the dude is tall, strong. I mean, you wouldn't want to get in a skirmish with him on the streets or anywhere else. Um, Not that he would attack you, but if he had to defend himself, you wouldn't want to be on the receiving end of what he's dishing out, right? And he said, I I resolved that even around my friends at a certain point in my life, I would, other men, he's like, I would be in places, you know, even at like a fight, uh, at like a boxing match or an MMA fight. And he's like, or when I'd have discussions with men, if I felt that I needed to cry, he's like, I wouldn't hold back my tears because I decided I'm not going to be afraid of what other people think about me expressing my emotions as a man. And he writes about this in his book. He shares videos. Some of the young men that he has these videos with, while he's teaching them to like break a board or to do jujitsu or different self-defense things, uh, if a kid cries, he takes time and stops and affirms them. And he says, son, why are you crying? And, he's go- and the kid's going, I don't know. He says, son, you need to process your emotions. You need to trust in God. You need to find out what's going on in your heart. Why are you feeling this way? Because these emotions are going to rise in your life in the future. And if you don't know how to process them, you're going to make bad decisions based on how you're feeling emotionally. But you need to learn how to process them so that you don't, you don't let them control you in the future. And he'll say, I'm afraid. Well, what are you afraid of? And he'll say, it's okay to cry, son. It's okay. It, I cry as a man. It's okay. We cry as men at different times times. And he'll tell all the other students, this is why we're here. We're here to support one another when we're going through these hard times. He doesn't shame him. And this is, you know, a typical place, a martial arts or a self-defense training, combat training studio is typically a place where you would, in our culture, you would hear a man say, buck up, don't cry, don't be a wimp, go sit down until you deal with this. This is embarrassing. That's typically what most of us hear in the cultural narrative of manhood. But here he's saying, no, we cry as men. We let our emotions out. It's okay. We're here for you. Let's Let's work through that. And then he helps him overcome the obstacle. And these videos are very, very powerful examples of positive uh, 
fathering, of, of positive mentoring. And I would encourage you to check them out. But there is something about how we need to allow the Lord to minister to the place of our soul. And I know I've been crying a lot, been laughing a lot. Uh, sometimes I make jokes and you think, why is he joking right now at a time like this? Well, uh, because that it helps me through it helps me through the grief. And I guarantee you, um, you know, just sometimes random times throughout the day, I just look over at my wife and I just tears are coming down my cheeks and, and I don't know why for sure. Or walking through the offices and seeing Pastor Scott's empty office. Uh, or being in a meeting with our staff and thinking there's a hole here because he used to sit here and he used to talk with us just not that long ago. And so uh, there's all these different emotions that hit and I've had to express them and process them. And I encourage you to do the same, to invite the Lord in as a good shepherd. Say, Lord, what am I feeling? Would you help me with this? Talk to him, invite him into the pain, invite him into the anger. You know, he's a big God. He's a big dad. He's, he's not put off by your, um, by your anger. He's not put off by your emotions. He can handle it. You know, we don't want to live in like an unresolved anger towards God. That would be an unhealthy place to live. But it is pro it's healthy in our process of grief to express our emotions to God and tell him what we really feel. I mean, he obviously knows what we feel and what we think anyway, but it's very important that we express those things to him and we allow him into those places in our lives. So it says that he guides us along the right paths as, and he does this for his namesake. And he goes on to say that even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so uh, David says as the psalmist that the Lord is our shepherd. He causes us to lie down in green pastures. First we lack nothing, then we lie down in green pastures. He leads us beside quiet water so he can refresh and restore us. He guides us along the right paths or paths of righteousness for his namesake. So he causes us to live a life that pleases him in righteousness and living according to his ways. But he's not just with us in the pleasures. He's with us in the pains. It says that also he's with us through the darkest valleys where we will fear no evil. That's powerful. Even though we walk through the darkest valley, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, as many translations say, we will fear no evil. I will fear no evil. And you've got to make a decision as you trust in the Lord to not give fear a voice in your life. We are living in a cultural moment that is being overcome by fear. People are so fearful uh, of, of COVID-19, of the outcomes of elections. People are so fearful uh, about so many things. And honestly, uh, fears try to have a voice in my life several times throughout the, this COVID-19 season of restrictions ever since March. Um, you know, it's like, what email am I going to get next? What bad news is coming? What announcement? What restriction is coming down the pike? Uh, you know, what could happen? And then these last, you know, this last eight days or so has been a little bit crazy because there was already enough trouble to deal with in 2020. And then to lose Pastor Scott and right before that, Pastor Andre's dad and to lose, um, you know, to have more restrictions come back again, to have my parents test positive for COVID-19. I mean, it, it, got, it, 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 it could have been very easy to surrender to a spirit of fear, is what I'm trying to say. Because your mind, naturally, the way we process things, could easily go towards, well, pff, what else could happen? You know, what's next? Oh, boy. Uh, what's 2020 got for us next? And it, it, could, it could easily get us into that mode of thinking. But very early in the lockdown, I was watching a video of Dr. Michael Brown and he was giving counsel to pastors around the nation saying, should you open your church? Should you keep it closed? Um, and he was saying, you know, it's not so much that there's one answer for everybody. Every state, every city, every church, every congregation has different needs, different requirements, different things to consider. So he says, oh, I believe the Lord will guide you where you're, where you're at. But he said, the number one thing you need to make sure to do as a pastor and a leader in the body of Christ right now is you need to put down the spirit of fear. And we see that in Psalms 23. Even though no matter how dark it is, no matter how much loss and how much grief and how much pain, we still have a choice of whether we submit to fear or not. Now, it seems like 
in the natural, it would be very logical to be like, we should be panicking. Everything's going to be. No. We, we are a people of faith. If the Lord is my shepherd and he is with me, he walks me through the darkest valleys. And even like the Apostle Paul told Timothy, you have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. So I have a choice that I'm going to listen to fear or I'm going to listen to faith. And you have that same choice too. And I want to encourage you, don't surrender to the emotions. Process them, express them, but don't surrender to them. Don't become a slave of your feelings. Feelings. Don't become a slave of your circumstances. Let the good shepherd into your life. Let his rod and his staff comfort you and guide you and guard you in this time. For he has your best interest in mind. You've got to choose to say, I'm putting fear down. Fear, you are under my feet. I will not submit to you. And I've learned many times, and even in this last couple weeks, I'm, I'm learning it and I'm relearning it again and again. I'm practicing it. I'm living in it. I am not living in fear. Because I know that the Lord is with me. I know that he protects me. And I'm not going to let my imagination get the best of me to think what else could go wrong next. I remember Pastor Bill Johnson when his dad died of cancer. And he shared this message. And while he was sharing, his mom, they got a message that his mom was being rushed to the hospital just a couple days while he's speaking to his church on a Sunday morning, right? You know, like it was a couple days after his dad just died. And he made this statement. He prayed in faith that she would be healed. And he said, I'm not going to be afraid of what's happening right now with my mom. He said, if we believe a lie, crisis will follow crisis. And it's true. We'll start getting into a mode where we're looking for crisis. We're expecting crisis and we'll get out of faith and we'll live in fear. It's very important that we don't live in fear. The media is broadcasting things. Neighbors, loved ones, coworkers are telling you different things that are trying to put fear all over people. Now at Sunrise, we've been careful to ask people to distance and wear masks, and we're going to continue to do so because we do know there are real risks. There are people that have suffered from this disease. Like I said, my parents are not in a horrible place. Thank the Lord. Uh, keep praying for them. We want to see them fully recover quickly and with full strength. Um, it's not something we take lightly. Uh, so some people have acted like, well, if you have faith, you don't care about anything else. Well, no, you can have wisdom and care for others and show compassion to others who are vulnerable, but I want to implore you not to be given over to a spirit of fear. And as a church, when, the, when restrictions come on the church, I, I believe that we should work. Uh, to, the Bible is very clear that we should honor governing authorities. And as much as it depends on us, we should live quiet and peaceable lives. That we, should, that we should have peace with governing authorities. And we should go about our business in a way that is not trying to be disruptive of government and what they're trying to do for the safety of people. But on the other hand, we are also not to uh, allow the government to dictate how we worship or how we practice our beliefs. And so we will continue to honor governing authorities, but we're not going to be afraid. If we're told not to sing, well, we're going to sing. I mean, I can't stop people from singing. I can't stop people from worshiping God. If God. The scripture tells us that when we gather, we sing, then we go with scripture. Right? We always go with what God instructs us to do. We're, we've been told, uh, I mean, technically we're not supposed to do water baptisms, but we had to start baptizing people because Jesus was given all authority in heaven and on earth, and he commanded us to go preach the gospel, make disciples, and baptize people. And so we're not going to stop preaching the gospel, we're not going to stop uh, making disciples, and we're not going to stop baptizing people, right? And I know some churches have gone to like the super soaker, like spray them with water from six feet or more away, or dump five, like throw five-gallon buckets of water on people, but I'm like, this is baptism. This is a holy thing under the Lord. And, and so the, the Bible says, lay your hands on the sick. And so, you know, my conviction is if somebody has COVID-19, I, I, I can't walk into hospitals right now and do that. But what I want to, what my conviction is, is if I've been instructed to pray for the sick, I'm going to pray for the sick, whether it's COVID-19 or anything else. That is my conviction as a follower of Christ. I have faith in his word to protect me and to bring healing to people that I pray for. And so I'm not going to be afraid. Now, that doesn't mean I'm going to like, you know, wipe sweat off my forehead and lay my hand on them and rub my face, you know, up next to theirs while I hug them and pray for them. And, and I can wear a mask. I can, I can, you know, put my hand on their shoulder and pray for somebody. But I'm not, I'm, I'm not afraid. And I have, a clear, I have a clear instruction from Scripture. This is how we practice our faith. And so I'm going to practice my faith. I'm, not, uh, I'm going to continue to honor where I can. But ultimately, we're going to be a people that don't move in 
fear, but move in faith. Now, I'm not trying to say that if you have a compromised immune system or uh, that you, you don't feel comfortable in your conscience gathering, that you're in fear. I'm not trying to say that you're in fear, but I'm trying to ask all of us to examine. Let's not let fear have the final word. It might be the right thing for you to do to stay home. I cannot guarantee everybody's safety, even with masks uh, on, even if nobody's saying, you know, and everybody perfectly socially distanced. I can't guarantee that you're never gonna contract COVID from somebody else in a church building. It's impossible to know everybody that, that comes in and where their level of faith is and where their level of hygiene is and, uh, and their level of health. If you don't feel good, stay home. If you're running a fever, definitely stay home. Um, you know, and, and continue to participate online uh, and don't feel ashamed for that. But what I am asking all of us to do in this season, whether it's grief, whether it's afraid of what could happen next or fear over election uh, results or who's our next president and all these things is let's not let fear have the final word. Let's be a people of peace. Let's be a distinctive people that know that the Lord is with us as our good shepherd. And let's let his rod and his staff comfort us in this time. And then coming out of the, the he, uh, David makes this pivot in the, in the psalm here, coming into verse five, because he was talking about how the Lord is my shepherd. He's speaking about the Lord, but he's going to switch to now speaking directly to the Lord as not just his shepherd, but as the host who invites him to this table. And he says, not only are you the Lord, the, you know, the Lord will do all these things and be this for you. But now he says, you, you, Lord, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. So when he brings us through the dark valleys and the, 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 the shadows of our lives, he comes and he brings us to a table that he seats us at in the presence of our enemies. I don't want to spend the bulk of the rest of my time here just kind of looking at what does that mean that he spreads a table for us before the presence of our enemies. Now, can you imagine going through the most difficult, trying times? And the Bible says that we have enemies because we're Christians. We have enemies that try to stop the gospel. We have enemies that are in unbelief against the work of Christ and the existence of God. Uh, we have enemies that persecute us. We also have spiritual enemies called demons or fallen angels. Uh, our, our adversary, Satan, uh, who the Bible says is like a, roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, right? That we have spiritual adversaries, these unseen but very real forces, these fallen creatures that try to stop us, that try to tempt us, that try to get us to do evil, that try to get us to not believe God, to try to get us in addiction or, or unresolved sorrow and pain in our hearts. Like the, these spirits are at work. And so we've got these enemies and they especially take opportunity against us when we're going through the darkest valleys. But it's in that place where the Lord, as our good shepherd, promises to spread a table out before us, right in front of our enemies. And I believe this speaks of at least five different things that I want to touch on. And first of all, it speaks of rest. It speaks of a finished work. You don't sit down to eat in a battle unless you're confident that you've got this thing locked down. It takes a pretty studly <laughs> commander-in-chief or good shepherd to think, you know what? Even though the enemy's still out there kind of watching, we're just going to sit down and we're going to have a meal right now. This speaks, this is a picture of the rest that we have in Christ. Reinhard Bonnke, in one of Darren Wilson's first documentaries, I don't remember if it was Father of Lights or Finger of God or which one it was for sure, but this documentary about miracles and all the great things God is doing around the world right now, uh, he's, he he. Uh, Reinhard Bonnke in his German accent, he uh, is English, is, is English German accent. He begins to talk about how in all the other religions that have these different idols and these many gods, in all those places, you spread the table for your God to worship your God or your idol. He said, but in the Christian faith, it is not so. In ours, in the Christian faith, God spreads the table for us. And that's what we see in Psalm 23. He does the work, we go and sit. And in the middle of our darkest times, we've got to learn how to rest and how to sit at his table and allow him to minister to us. We've got to take time away to grieve. We've got to take time to process. We've got to take time to pray and to hear and, and to rest. We've got to take time for vacation sometimes. And I know it seems kind of weird to not be able to travel as much right now, but you might need a staycation. Get, do, get something that helps bring you joy uh, in the season that you're in and, and, and a place of rest. But more than uh, just practically or emotionally, but even this is a picture of how Jesus spreads the table for us as our good shepherd, that he did the work. When Jesus died on the cross and he rose from the dead, 
He offers us a place at the table that he provides for us what we need. He provides himself and he provides a place where we don't strive to work things out in our own strength, but we simply respond by faith to what he has already accomplished for us. Secondly, this is confidence. This is a, being him inviting us, preparing a table for us is an act of confidence that he's got things under control. It doesn't always feel like life's in control, but God has a greater purpose and plan. God has victory over his enemies. God knows what he's doing, and he knows how to work all things together uh, for good. He knows how to work all things according to the counsel of his will, the scripture says. And so he's not caught off guard by what seems like the untimely death of Pastor Scott. He's not caught off guard by the different things that are going on in our culture. He's not caught off guard by COVID-19, but he can confidently say, come, just come and sit at the table. Yeah, there's enemies out there. You just walk, I just walked you through the darkest valley. Thank you that he didn't walk us into the darkest valley. He walked us through the darkest valley because these valleys aren't here to stay. The shadows aren't here to stay. They're only seasons. They're only times that he walks us through it. Come on, somebody. He doesn't walk us into it. He walks us through it. So we come out of it. But even when the enemies surround us and try to take advantage of these times where we're vulnerable, there the Lord is confidently saying, Saying, I've got this. You can sit down and you can eat with me. Don't panic. Don't fear. Don't fight in your own strength. And there's this powerful song that we, we've sang, like, this is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. And part of it comes from Psalm 23. And inter interestingly enough, I think a lot of people have sung that song when we sing that line, this is how I fight my battles, implying that maybe through singing and worship is how we fight our battles. And that's, there's definitely scriptural truth to that reality. But what, if you understand, and then they kind of rewrote the spontaneous song into a real song, and it gives you more of the context. But you may have missed in that song, what they're referring to is like Psalm 23 and the, also the communion table, that we have confidence that we, the way we fight our battles is that we come and we get seated at the table where he serves us in the presence of our enemies. It's not about how hard we worship that we fight our battles. Now, there is a time of contending in worship, contending in prayer. But the heart of the song was actually reflective of Psalm 23 and reflective of the communion table where our confidence is not in what we do. Our confidence or our, how we fight our battles is we come and have a seat where he gives us the victory. Does that make sense? Maybe I'm getting some amens online. Amen. I've got Pastor Kevin here. He's sitting up front to help the boy. So it's not a completely empty room, and I really appreciate it. <laughs> but we have confidence. And number three, we have joy. A feast brings us joy. In the middle of the darkest times, part of the way we process the sorrows is we remember the things to be thankful for and celebrate. One of the things that uh, Grace and I have tried to do, of course, this last week is check in on Leanne and check in with the Smith family as best we can. And uh, one of the things I found is that when we called Leanne to try to help encourage her, I ended up feeling really encouraged. <laughs> so I think it was Friday night. Grace and I were on the phone to Leanne and we were just talking and man, we laughed so much. We cried a little bit. Um, but we laughed a lot and having Leanne and Grace together on the phone is a treat because they're just very funny. The two of them, they're two peas in a pod and they just, uh, but I was like, just having that being, being together, talking together, there's something about eating a meal together, right? That brings a sense of joy and celebration. And I think it's a very, very Important for us as we allow the Lord to shepherd us and restore our souls is that we're also in the middle of grief. We're thankful for the good times. And we remember those things. And uh, we've been, even earlier in the week when we were at the Smith's house, once Leanne got back from Missouri, we were just laughing and with the staff even, just all the stories. Uh, you know, even in Scott's death, it, it just, as shocking and sad as it, as it has all been, you know, it was very interesting that the, the chaplain that came to visit the Smith's house, right, you know, um, was sent there right after the medics left to comfort people and find out what, what we needed. And he was overwhelmed at how many pastors and Christians were in the house. And he's like, okay, wow. Well, it turns out, you know, if you didn't know Pastor Scott's story, he's been a drummer his whole life. He's mentored and trained drummers, helped invest in drummers all over the world. He's been a judge for drum off competitions. He's just an incredible, phenomenal musician, drummer. 
Um, and so this guy's like, I'm a 40-year drummer. And he saw the snare drums in uh, the Smith's living room when he was there. And he said, well, this is, you know, not something I usually do, but I usually pray a prayer if I'm able to, if the family allows me to. But since I'm with all Christians today, and this guy was a pastor, and a, he says, and since this man was a drummer, he must be a musical man. He, and I want to honor him with not just a prayer, but I want to sing the prayer. And so he sings this long song, prayer, and it was really awkward. And we were like, I was kind of like, man, I wish I would have told him, like, hey, we're good. We're all pastors. We're going to pray with everybody. You got people in shock. You got people praying for resurrection. You got people in grief. And then you got this guy singing. And honestly, it felt like a Saturday Night Live skit. Like, is this really happening right now? But the funny thing is, like, even Leanne, was, when we were talking there, she goes, you know, Scott, he kind of had a twisted sense of humor. Like, she'd have to use, she would have to send him out of, like, middle school or high school, like, recitals uh, for choir or band because he would start laughing. Like, when something tickled his funny bone and he could find humor in almost anything, then he really got to laughing. He'd get to that silent laugh mode if you knew him, and it was, like, it was infectious. Everybody's laughing just because he's laughing like that. And so... Um, you know, so if Scott's looking down on the scene in his living room where his body lays and everybody's there gathering, praying, and then this guy's singing, I'm pretty sure that Scott, we were, we were telling Leanne, he's like, oh yeah, she, if he's looking down on that moment, he's definitely laughing. And so even in all of that turmoil, we're finding joy in who Scott was, who he is still as he lives with Jesus forever. Um, and, and we find that the, this is an important part of being seated at the table. Even while we have enemies surrounding us and there's things uncertain, it's important for us to, to be able to laugh. It's important for us to be able to cry. It's important for us to be able to express our emotions and to be able to move back and forth in between these things is a normal and healthy process of grief for us. And then fourthly, um, the table speaks of communion. It speaks of a common union, of a, of a true fellowship that we have one with another. When we're seated at the table of the Lord, we're not just seated with him, but we're seated with one another. And just being able to be with the Smith family, being able to talk on the phone with them, um, to be able to express, to have real heart-to-heart -heart talks. And sometimes you don't have much words, but to just express sorrow together and cry together and it was like that with our staff this week as we met together. We met to, to cry and to pray and to share stories. And it was just, it was a beautiful time. It was a healthy time. It was a hard time. Uh, and, and we, but we share, we share something together. You know, we, we don't have all the answers for each other, but at least we have each other, right? And, and being seated at a table where the Lord spread, puts his spread out for us, it brings us into that place of unity. And of course, I believe that Psalm 23 is even a, an allusion to the communion table, where we take the bread, the body of the Lord, and the cup, the blood of our Lord Jesus in communion. We take the elements, we take this holy meal together. Jesus told us that when we came to the table of the Lord, that we were to do this often as the church family in remembrance of him until he returns. That we're to regularly as the church celebrate who Jesus is for us. It's a time where every time the church gathered in the early church, they would have a feast, they would have a meal together. And the, the, the pinnacle or the highlight of that meal and of their gathering in their homes was that they would have a love feast. And then the, the, the love feast was they would present the wine and they would present the, the bread. They would present the blood and the body of Jesus. And that means every time they gathered, they were focused on the gospel. They were focused on what they had in common. And outsiders were going to see this meal that the believers got to have and that weren't Christians yet and go, why are you having this part? What does it mean? And they would hear the gospel every single time they met. And it would pull them together. And they came from different classes. And we see that, that they were male, female, that they were Jew, Greek, that they were uh, Scythian, barbarian, that they were free men or slave. But yet they all had something in common in Christ. And it was the table, being seated at the table that caused us to put down our differences and to be one with one another. And uh, the communion was a place where people could receive healing, where they could receive forgiveness of sins, where they could celebrate who Jesus is, one for another. And so it's so important that we understand the fellowship that we have at the table of the Lord. And that a lot of our healing comes from, of course, the person and the work of Christ and how he draws us together as one body and one family. And we can minister to that place. We can minister 
from that place one to another. And then fifthly, the table speaks of reconciliation. Jesus used the table. He sat with tax collectors and sinners, outcasts and people that were despised and people that should be overlooked by most people's standards for being a part of his kingdom by loving them and reaching out to them with the gospel of the kingdom by giving them a seat or taking a seat even at their table. And even Pastor Herb shared some prophetic uh, instructions for prayer. And one of those was about the church practicing hospitality in this season. And I know it's going to be difficult right away to practice hospitality, but it's very important that we look at how we can re- see people reconciled to God through the power of the table and a shared meal. And I think the church, you know, Christians, we need to maybe have some white supremacists at our table to help get them out of hatred. <laughs> and help them come under a kingdom worldview and a, a biblical worldview for valuing all people. We need to sit with black people that are part of the Black Lives Matter organization that are in the witchcraft part or people that are part of Antifa, people that are rioters. We need to sit with people that are different that we might love them to Christ. We need to sit with people that are, maybe we need to sit with some of the criminal leaders of our cities or we need to sit with politicians or people that are atheists or family members or neighbors or people that vote differently than us or have different values than we do so that we might love them. And, and, and Jesus was not ever afraid of guilt by association. I know that our world is so full of identity politics right now. And if you talk to somebody or you have a cup of coffee at Starbucks with somebody, you must totally agree with everything they do. Or if you show up at this event or that event, then people judge you and write you off. Jesus, he faced the same pressures when he sat with the the sinners, when he met with the Pharisees and the Sadducees, when he was with his disciples. Why do you choose these disciples? I mean, there's so many times that people will judge you, but what Jesus recovered for us is that what happens in Psalm 23 is that at the table of the Lord, people are transformed. Bring people to the table that think differently, act differently, vote differently, and influence them with the love of Christ. It's important that the church does not lose their distinctions for righteousness and holiness, but in the middle of being distinct and righteous and holy in the world, we're not to be out of the world, we're to be in the world, influencing the world for the cause of Christ. And people can get reconciled to God at the table of the Lord. It says at the table of the Lord, that he anoints our head with oil and our cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow us all the days of our life and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I love that he leads us through the darkest valley. He sets a table before us where he anoints our head with oil so that goodness and mercy or goodness and love follow us all the days of our life. But ultimately our dwelling place for those of us who have made the Lord our shepherd is the house of the Lord forever and ever and ever. You know, Pastor Scott is experiencing the fullness of what that means. We know we're not all going to, of course, go through uh, a season of physical death in 2020. Most of us will not experience that. But what? But what? But there does come a point in time where where our day is up, and like Pastor Scott, he's now experiencing. He he's experiencing uh, with sight and with feel and with his actual experience what we believe by faith. That he will dwell with the Lord forever and ever and ever. And I would have loved to see him raised up. I would love to have people pray for me like people pray for Pastor Scott. uh, If I experienced premature death, but I'm sure he didn't want to come back. I'm sure what he experienced when he saw Jesus face to face. The Apostle Paul promises if you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord. That what he was experiencing, seeing the one who loved him and gave himself for him on the cross face to face, and and the bliss and the pain-free life and and the the removal of sorrow that he he was doing, he's doing really well right now is what I'm trying to say. And our good shepherd Jesus, he is not only there for us emotionally and all those things, but he came in history 2,000 years ago. He came. He came to die for his sheep. He came to die for all those that would follow him and that that were far from him. He came to die for his enemies. The truth is that, that Jesus is our good shepherd. According to the prophecies of the Old Testament, he came and he lived a perfect and sinless life. He did many miracles and he he lived 2,000 years ago according to these prophetic promises, but he ultimately, the promises that were true and fulfilled according to the scripture were that he would die on the cross, that he would be buried, and that he would raise again. And after God raised him from the dead, he was seen by hundreds of eyewitnesses that could give a testimony to his resurrection. The Bible says that there is a day coming where Jesus will return to judge the living and the dead. And the promise is to you and me today and all who would call on the name of the Lord, if we call on Jesus as Lord, if we make him the good shepherd of our lives, we 
will receive forgiveness of sins and we will receive eternal life. And I'm here to invite you into that today, that if you don't know the Lord as your good shepherd, that you would repent of your sin and you would cling on to Jesus. And if you believe as through the preaching of the word, maybe it's through the testimony of Pastor Scott's life, you believe that you need Jesus and that you need to be reconciled to God, I'm inviting you to come to him for the first time or to come back home because his arms are open wide for you. He's already settled how he feels about you. He loves you because he sent his son Jesus to die for you. It's not up for debate. It doesn't matter how bad you've sinned, how bad you've blown it. It doesn't matter if you've never believed in him before. It doesn't matter if you wrote him off and said you would never believe. It doesn't matter if you've strayed from him. If you return to him, if you repent and you say, I need you to be the good shepherd of my life. I need you to be the savior of my soul. Forgive me of my sin. I believe you died on the cross and rose again for me. If you say that, you believe it in your heart, you will never be the same again. And we are here as a church family to teach you about baptism and being filled with the Spirit and walking out this Christian life as a follower, a disciple of Jesus. But if you want to make this decision, it's the most important decision you can make. And right in your home, I'd encourage you to get on your knees and pray this prayer with me. If you mean it from your heart, you'll never be the same. We want to give you a Bible. We want to help walk with you. We want you to get a hold of us if you're making this decision today. But just pray this prayer with me as a starting point for your faith. Say, Father God, thank you for Jesus, the good shepherd, dying for me on the cross and raising again to new life. I believe in you. Forgive me of my sin. Give me a new heart. I choose to follow you today. Fill me with your power. Comfort me, strengthen me, lead me. I choose to follow you. Thank you that I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And I want to pray for the rest of our church family. God, I pray your blessing and your comfort over Sunrise Christian Center. I pray you'd wrap your arms of love around us. I pray your mercy and peace would be upon us today, Lord God. I pray that you'd help us to grieve, Lord. We thank you that even in our sorrow, we have a hope, we have a trust, and we have a faith in our good shepherd to care for us through every season. Lord, I pray for deliverance from fear in this hour. I pray that we would be a distinctive people that walk in your purposes, Lord. I pray that we would be refreshed and that we would not be weary, that we would not move forward in our own strength. I pray that you would help us, God. Lord, I pray for those that have felt suicidal, those that have felt depressed, those that are experiencing domestic violence or increased pressure for a lack of finances. God, I pray that you would manifest as the good shepherd. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us love one another and reach out to one another to be your hands and feet the best we can in these limited times, God. I'm asking, God, that you would minister to the needs of our heart by your spirit, that you would help us keep our eyes on you, Lord, that our eyes would not, our perspective of you would not be tainted by what we walk through, but we would be strengthened by your Holy Spirit. We would be strengthened by your word, that we would see you, that we would know you, that we would trust in you, for you are good. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. I want to encourage you. We're going to do our best to reach out to people. We obviously have some holes in our staff right now, and, uh, but we're going to do our best with our, our volunteers, our care team, and our pastors just to keep loving and reaching out. Um, we'll get instructions about how things will be navigated this next week or these next several weeks out to you soon. But if you're hurting, if you're feeling suicidal, if you're feeling depressed, if you've got some really intense marriage or family things going on and things aren't safe for you, or we need to hear from you. We want to help you as best we can, so please get a hold of us. I know Pastor Scott was helping some people, and I don't even know your names. He kept it very confidential, but people even right up to the last week of his life that he was helping through suicidal thoughts, and they, we, want to re, we want to know who you are. We want to pray with you and support you um, and be a comfort to you, and so uh, continue to pray for the Smith family. Thank you for considering supporting them um, in the Scott Smith Legacy Fund. Uh, and thank you for just all that you're doing as a church family to rally around one another in these difficult times and love each other with the love of Christ. It's a beautiful thing to see the unity in our body, and we thank God for you. God bless you today.